You guys have heard this disclaimer. I'm not an attorney, I'm not an accountant, and who the hell would want to be one? I'm giving advice based on my experiences and successes. I do not claim that anything in this presentation is legal advice, is state advice, or good advice. Uh, any techniques I ever discuss with you, uh, this disclaimer protects me for the rest of my life. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's get on with the presentation. Okay, I'm going to cover some different things here. So should I pay off my house? All right? It's an interesting question. Some people like Dave Ramsey, well, he recommends exactly that. You know, he's, I don't think he's talking to the people in this room. He's not, okay? You guys, by the very nature of you being here, you're obviously smarter than the people that Dave Ramsey's talking to. He, he's, but he's probably talking to most of the country. Because most people don't put in the energy, the effort that you guys all have coming here on Monday nights, coming here on Thursday nights, learning all these strategies and being able to have an advantage, being able to have a team of people that you can talk to and get help from, right? Most people don't do that. So it's the kind of stuff that Dave Ramsey will tell people, you know, he's totally against debt, right? He hates debt, okay? Pay off your house now. That's exactly what he probably does. Uh, is there a better way to get rich? You're damn sure there is. We're going to talk about that tonight. Um, he's like the get out of debt preacher, you know? Like he'll tell you to get like a 15-year mortgage, okay? To me, that makes absolutely no sense at all. No sense. It is an idiotic thing to do. So the reason I say that is, Okay, so if you got a 15-year mortgage, and let's just say hypothetically your mortgage payment is $2,200 a month because you're trying to pay off this loan in 15 years, right? If you fall on some hard times, take it from a lifelong entrepreneur since 1989, you're going to fall on some hard times, especially if you don't have that regular paycheck coming in like entrepreneurs like myself have not had, right? If you had a 30-year mortgage, you would have a much safer piece of real estate because if you agree to pay this 15-year mortgage at $2,200 a month, but maybe a 30-year mortgage would be more like $1,500 a month. I'm just guessing at the numbers, but you get the point. The 30-year mortgage at $1,500 a month my payment is much lower, which makes my real estate deal safer. I can always choose if I've got a bunch of extra cash. I can always choose at any time I want during uh, a 30-year mortgage or even a 15-year mortgage, I can choose to pay more if I have the cash. That's not the part I'm worried about. I'm worried about if you hit some tough times You've just committed yourself to a $2,200 a month mortgage payment. Dave Ramsey tells people, no debt, no debt. I think that's very dangerous advice, all right? It's much safer to get, if, if you feel like you can afford a $2,200 a month, you should get a 30-year loan where your payment is $1,500 and pay a little extra every month, okay? If you want to pay the $22, you can pay the $22. You can easily do that. Send in the $15 plus send in an, an whatever else you have to to get to the number that you owe. But it's a much safer way to do it. That way, if you do fall on tough times, you can revert back to your $1,500 a month payment, which will be easier for you to cover. Okay? All right. Putting 100% down, I just did that for the first time in my life. Okay? As an investor. I started in this business in 1989 at the age of 23. I have never, ever, ever paid 100% down for a property until last week or two weeks ago now. Two weeks ago when I bought a mobile home park, all right? This is the first time I've ever done it. But I did it mostly because I was concerned about the stock market, okay? Right or wrong, I'm, I was concerned about it, and I wanted to get my money out, and I wanted to put it in something solid that was going to pay me a regular rent roll, okay? 
where it's kicking off, like since there's no mortgage on the, on the park, it's kicking off uh, over five grand a month right now. So I like that. That makes me feel comfortable, all right? Uh, Dave says that the payments that you have on any property, whether it's a house you live in or an investment property, should never be no more than a quarter of your pay stub. I don't know where he comes up with that formula. And, you know, with his advice of paying things off in 15 years, that's probably not even possible for a lot of people. Okay? So I always like to say, hey, it's good advice for people who are lousy with money. I get it. A lot of people are lousy with money. They don't have any training. They're not professional investors. So if you're not the brightest, you know, you know somebody who's not the brightest bulb in the world, this is probably okay advice for them, I guess. But the 15-year mortgage thing, I don't like at all. I think it's very dangerous. Okay. Let's keep going. So last night we're at the Capitol Grill, me, Jamie, Paul... Ken MacArthur, Larry, his wife, my wife, a bunch of us are at the Capitol Grill. We, um, we go out there when somebody wins the dinner with us, right? We go to the Capitol Grill in King of Prussia. And uh, we have this uh, big, fat, gigantic table full of food and a big, giant bill to come with it, right? Something we do every once in a while for... A couple of students who win the prize to get to hang out with us. And uh, so everybody just gets uh, the taste of what it's like to have a $350 dinner for one person. Right? Okay. After all, life is meant to be enjoyed, right? It's only money. Okay. So someone asked me, uh, George actually asked me at the table, he said... What was the first property you ever bought? And I had to think about it for a second because that was 32 years ago. But this is the property that I first bought. 3528 Arthur Street. Anybody know what neighborhood this is in? It's Holmesburg. It's Holmesburg. Yeah, it's Holmesburg. So this was the very first property that I ever bought. I think I bought it for like uh, $69,000, something like that. And... Um, what had happened was I got rear-ended on Bristol Road in Warminster. I used to work at this company called Alpha Laval, which is like right at the corner of Mearns. You used to work there? Yeah. Really? I think we talked about this before. No. Yeah, we did. No, you didn't. Yeah. We compared old Bay Stubbs and I made more money than you. You don't remember that part? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I thought we did talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually live like two blocks from that company now. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm on. I'm at a red light at the corner of, uh, I guess it's New Newtown Road in Bristol. What are you hollering out? <laughs> I wasn't driving a convertible back then. I think I was driving a Mercury Zephyr. <laughs> yeah, but did you take your like top a, down? I, a K car, you know, like one of them K cars. Uh, I used to call it the uh, the uh, indestructible Mercury Zephyr because I had had a, a series of accidents with it and the thing never dented. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know. All right, so I get rear-ended at, waiting at the red light. Some lady in a station wagon somehow wasn't paying attention. She plows into the back of me, right? So, uh, you know, I was a poor, broke kid, and all I thought to myself was, hmm, I might be able to get some real estate out of this. <laughs> right? So, uh, of course, I had terrible neck pain, and um, I went to the doctor, and uh, I got some kind of settlement. I don't even remember what it was. It, it might have been like 10 grand, okay? So I used the funds to buy this property. The money I got from the accident, I used to buy my very first property, which was a duplex. Okay, and at the time I was like, uh, you know, I'm 22, 23 years old. My dad and I, you know, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff. We weren't getting along too good in those days, and uh, he used to drive me nuts. He'd walk into the TV room and turn the volume all the way down. I'm like, and then he'd walk out of the room. I'm like, you just left the room. What the hell do you care? <laughs> anyway, um, I decided to to sacrifice, I really, really wanted to move into this duplex. I wanted to live on my own, get away from uh, my crazy brother and, you know, 
get a little, see what it's like to live on my own. But I decided the smarter move was don't move into this duplex right now. I put my tenants on month to month leases and in case you haven't figured it out, I banged them for a much higher rent immediately upon buying the building. It's, uh, that is what landlords should do. You don't even think about it. Sorry, Charlie, but that's what you do. Okay, You buy a property, you raise the rents. One of the tenants on the first floor said, I'm not paying that rent. She was paying $325 a month to live in this first floor in uh, 1987. I guess it was. And I was just like, you know, do whatever you want to do. And she said, well, I'm leaving. And I said, fine, you know, I'll, I'll even help you move if you want. You know, get the, I wanted to get the apartment empty and I wanted to go in and fix it up and paint it and, and get it back up for rent and get somebody else who was going to pay me like $150 more a month. And that's what I did. So um, I didn't move into it. I lived with my family for another year, a lot of pain. You know, if you want to if you want to get wealthy, sometimes, you know, not living in your property, living where you can live for free makes sense. All right. Sometimes if you can if you can hack it. All right. So one of the things that was really funny about it, I remember when I started interviewing people to rent my property, I was 23 years old and people were coming in that were like 33 years old and they're like, you're the landlord. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm the landlord. I'm standing here. I'm telling you, here's my card. Here's my lease. Here's my application. I'm the landlord. And they're like, you're the landlord? It's like, not your dad's property? I'm like, what do you think? Like a 23-year-old can't buy a property? <laughs> it was a lot of that kind of stuff. It turned out to be a wonderful learning experience for me. Uh, my father wasn't the kind of guy who would fix things in our house. He was the kind of guy who would pay people to fix things in our house. So I really hadn't had no experience at all at working on a property. I had never even painted a wall before. But my mother uh, was a very talented uh, woman who was afraid of nothing. And my mother came down and her and I figured out a lot of stuff. And we got the house looking sharp and we got it all rented up. And she helped me with it. She would also get together with me and help me cheat on my taxes. <laughs> I learned that from mom too. Mom was, uh, she wasn't afraid of much. Okay, so let's, let's just think again about, is there a better idea than paying off the house that you're living in? Is there a better idea? I think absolutely there is, okay? So you got to have the right mentality. You got to think like a rich person. A rich person wants to win the game of life. They want to win, all right? And they're willing to take chances. And you're going to have to take chances in your life. At this point, all I had done was buy one duplex. I'm hardly getting rich from this thing, okay? And if you know anything, I, I said 1987. It was actually 1989 that I bought the duplex on the last slide, 3528 Arthur Street in Holmesburg. If you know anything about real estate cycles, what happened in 1989? Anybody know? Well, 89, it was still going down. It, the market went down from 1989 when I bought the house. I didn't know much about cycles at the time. I'm just 23 years old. I'm, I'm drunk and high half the time, so what did I know, right? And the real estate market went down for like another six years. So... It sort of, it wasn't going down a ton, but it was going down like 3, 3%, 3 4% a year. And by 1995, my property was significantly worth less than what it was. But some of my friends, one of my friends was a mortgage guy, and uh, he thought he knew everything, and he's telling me, you should just dump it. You should just dump it. Get out. Get out. Sell it. Sell it. And I was like, nah, nah, nah I'm not going to do it, man. It'll come back. I said, it'll come back. Look, I'm... I'm I'm freaking, even by 1995, I mean, I wasn't even 30 yet. I'm like, you know, I, I think I got some time in front of me in life. I'm not going to sell it. But what, what I think is a much better idea than paying off a primary residence, you know, where you, you got to go out and you got to buy more investment properties. For those of you who've never, who've never done this, I, I felt like I was very aggressive. And 
And one of the things that happened to me was, uh, you know, I, ha I have like a winner's mentality, even though I didn't even fully believe I was a winner when I was 23 years old. But I slowly began to believe it. I remember hanging out in a bar one time, and, and I got a lot of confidence from this. I was talking to a couple of girls, and I said, uh, yeah, I own two houses. Because we haven't got to that slide yet, but I own two houses, right? And a girl said, nobody owns two houses. And I'm like, well, well, yeah, you, can, you, you do understand that you can buy these things, and you can put people in it, and they pay you rent. You do understand, right? right? And uh, it gave me confidence, because here's a sexy girl I'm talking to, and she just didn't believe that I owned two houses. I said, well, well, go over and ask my friends or something how many houses I own. Maybe they'll tell you the truth. Uh, anyway, so if you, if you bought a house in the past, the chances of your house being worth a lot more than you paid for it is extremely possible, certainly in this market, not necessarily in 1989 when I bought this, okay? Uh, I was actually down, but I was still in. And just like a stock option, you don't win, you don't make any money, and you don't lose any money until the day you sell it, right? Okay? So, one of, the, one of the things that I had planned to do with my very first property was, at some point, when the value went up, I was going to go to a bank, I was going to ask for a HELOC, which is, if you don't know what that is, it's a home equity line of credit. And if you had some equity in the building, maybe the building had $20,000 in equity. This building did not have $20,000 in equity in it. But if it did have it, I could go to a bank and get a home equity line of credit. And a home equity line of credit is awesome because it's renewable. So really what I mean by that is if a bank said, we're going to give you a $20,000 line of credit, I could use that money. Maybe I would use all of it. Maybe I would use part of it. And I could pay it down, pay it, give the bank back the money, and reuse the money again. So it's like a revolving line of credit that's always there as long as you pay it back. So if you bought it to buy a new property, it could be the $20,000 could be a down payment on a new property. And then the tenants are paying you rent. And if you've got the guts to push the rent higher, you're going to make more money which you could throw back on the $20,000 line and pay it back off. And when the line is replenished or partially replenished, you take the 20 grand and you do it again. Okay? So that was sort of my plan. I, I wanted to buy another house with new funds, whether that came from a home equity line of credit or I could get a bank to refinance my loan. But my house wasn't appreciating in value, so I really couldn't do that. And I could have uh, maybe got a loan from another source, like a hard money lender or a private money lender. But believe it or not, in, the, in 1989 to, ni to, to um, say, the middle of the 1990s, there were no hard money lenders or private money lenders. And I'll tell you why. Because anybody who could fog a mirror could get a loan. You just had to be alive. And they would give you all... I never got turned down for a loan between the years of 1989 and 2008 when the market crashed. That's a long time. That's a long time, right? <clears throat> I never was turned down for a loan until after the crash of 2008. Okay, if you're a smart manager, if you know how to fix shit and get it done quickly and do it for the cheap, that's a great management skill to have. Now, I didn't have that skill, but I always went and fixed my properties. And over the years, it probably took me like a good uh, eight to 10 years to learn how to fix a lot of things, but I was just determined to do it because I knew I was going to be in the real estate business. So good management can help you make a lot more money. Okay, so this property, is a triplex. It's 9160 LE Drive. Anybody know what neighborhood this is? Good guess, man. Yes, Tarsdale. This is right by the Academy Road Exit 95. This was a very cool triplex. Uh, right under the word triplex, that's the one I lived in. 
And uh, I lived on the first floor. I lived on the second floor. For like a year, I lived on the first floor. Then I lived on the second floor for a year. Second floor had a bar. I used to have parties there all the time. I had a blast. There was an after-hours club right at the Delaware River called the um, the Yacht Club, right? They were open at like what? Uh, yeah, something like that, 5 in the morning, right? Hey, Billy, if you were hanging out there, I, w I knew you from 1980s, so... I had a hell of a lot of fun in them days. Then I got smart. There was a, all these properties in the back. Uh, I couldn't get a picture off of Google of the back of the property. But all the properties in the back had garage doors. And somebody had taken out the garage door and bricked up the whole garage door, right? And put a man door on the other side. It was like one of those gigantic double wide garage doors. He took out only one of the garage doors, and he put a man door in there. And I said, perfect, this thing is going to be a triplex, right? So I moved, this smartest thing I did, I moved out of the second floor into the basement. When I moved into the basement, there was like nothing, okay? But this was really smart, and this is when I started to figure out that the cash flow that you can make in this business. So the way I bought this property first is, um, first of all, you know, I missed something I want to show you. So when I bought this first property, right, when I went to get the loan for it, I told the bank, I'm going to live in it, right? It's going to be my primary residence. So when I went to buy this property, this is my second property, which was only 11 months after I bought the first one. The way I was able to afford it was the company I was working for offered me unlimited overtime. So I went from making like not even 30 grand a year to working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And I made like, I think it was like 70 grand or something, which was like a lot of money back then to me, certainly to me. And I saved enough money to put a down payment on this property right here. Then I still had extra money. So I went down to the basement, I moved into the basement. Now I had tenants on the first floor, tenants on the second floor paying me strong rents, and I'm living in a basement for free, right? And it, it didn't happen right away, but I owned this property for like 10 years, and I know I was making somewhere around $900 a month cash flow living in the basement. And I, I'll tell you what, the basement wasn't bad. I built a bar down the basement. I had a bar on the second floor. Uh, the only window in the whole apartment was a peephole, right? So, like, somebody's knocking on the door real aggressive. You know, I load up the guns. I look through the peephole. Who the hell is knocking on my door like that, right? Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was day or night most of the time, right? <laughs> right? It was a great apartment because I had no windows, so nobody could see me. I liked it a lot, right? So I turned the basement into this other unit. And let me tell you a little bit about it. So when I first moved down there, I built... The very first thing I had to do is build a bathroom. I, I need a place to go to the bathroom, man. Can't be, like, you know, using the five-gallon buckets from Home Depot, you know? <laughs> right? So... I slept on the floor right next to an electric radiator on a sleeping bag. I used to take showers at the Gold's Gym at Grant and Boulevard, if anyone knows where that is, right? I lived in the basement for free, collected strong rents from the other two floors, but I went through a lot of sacrifice, you know? I didn't have a lot of money. I bought a bunch of used, uh, people were like getting rid of these crappy kitchen cabinets. They, they were okay, but they weren't the same design. They were like a mix of different ones. And I'm like, look, if it can hold the pasta, I'm fine with it, right? So I bought these things like dirt cheap. I hung them up. I built a kitchen out of like a flea market style uh, kitchen cabinets that didn't even match. But it functioned, right? I hung all the sheetrock. I, I built this beautiful bar. And I made it my home. And I lived there for a long time. And that was a great time for me because I was accumulating cash flow. I had a job and I was making almost $1,000 a month from this property. And it worked out really good for me. Okay. So this is a, what I'm explaining to you today is this is a great way to get into the business. You got to get your first property. You got to add value to it somehow. One way you could add value is by raising the rent. Another way you can add value is by fixing it up. And then over time, time just happens, right? You don't have to do anything for time. 
But if you keep up on your property and you're making it nice as, you know, every time, commit some time. To, you know, it's an investment property, right? So you don't have to go there all the time. But you want to go there on a regular basis and make sure it's being taken care of properly, right? And even if you could pay your tenants to do something, if, if, if that's something you feel like doing, right? Keep the thing looking nice, all right? This here property is... 4407 Shellmire. Anybody know what neighborhood this is in? Mayfair. Mayfair. I did live in Taconi for a while, too. I had a house there, too. So <clears throat> here's a couple things I would tell you if you're getting started in real estate business. Buy properties as soon as you can acquire them because you need to own a property for a period of time for it to accrue in value and for you to make changes to it and for you to raise the rent and for you to be thinking of ideas to make your property worth more money right that is the best way to build wealth in the real estate business you know getting a 30-year loan or longer okay or longer that's right suppose i went to a bank and and i said do you have a 50-year mortgage right my payment might be 600 bucks a month. What the hell do I care if it takes 50 years to pay it off? I'm not paying it off anyway. The tenants are, all right? They're the ones paying me every month. And I bet you your ass, their rent ain't $600 a month, right? So the beauty of it is, if I have a very small payment, if I ever fall on hard times, I don't have to worry so much about that house. I will never lose that house, right? even though I sold it already. But the thinking is, when I bought it, I'm not going to lose the house. Yes, Paul? Do you recommend doing interest only for a lower payment and then just putting down whatever <coughs> you want as principal? Private lenders will give you interest only. Banks usually will not. Banks will... I've never heard of a bank that will do interest only. I'm thinking before 2008. But... <laughs> but Asking for a 40-year mortgage or a 50-year mortgage, in my opinion, is very smart. Just in case something bad happens. It, if, it, so if it doesn't happen, you could pay, you could pay it on, as, as if it was a 30-year mortgage, as if it was a 20-year mortgage, whatever you want. But the fact that you keep your payments low, to me, is just smart. You're never going to be in a pinch where you can't make that payment. And that's, you, you have to, you know, I want to protect the downside. And, and having a, mo a large 40-year uh, loan, 50-year loan, 30-year loan minimum, right? You're never going to be in that pinch. And that's what I, why I like it. So I'm always putting down as little as possible as far as how much money I got to put down. And I always tell the mortgage company I'm going to live in it, okay? Everyone, I, li I didn't live in all of these houses, but I told the mortgage company I lived in all of them. Are you going to, you know, why are you moving out of uh, Arthur Street, the very first property you bought? I don't like the neighbor. His dog keeps barking at me. I'm scared of dogs. Tell him any damn thing you want, right? Then I went to this, to this triplex. I lived in this for nine years. But while I was living in it, I was buying these other properties in Mayfair. Back in the day, in, in the mid-90s, when I was buying properties in Mayfair, you could buy these row homes for 30 grand. And I used to call it the... Uh, all money down techniques. So what I did was I Ellie Drive, uh, this property, had a, had a decent amount of equity in it after nine years. I got a home equity line of credit against this property, which I was living in at the time. And I got a $60,000 HELOC, which is a revolving line. So I would buy the property for 30 grand. I'd put seven grand into fixing up the property. I'd put tenants in there who were paying me strong rents i go right back to the bank and say how much would you give me for this property they would refi the whole thing sometimes it would cost me a couple grand sometimes i would lose a couple grand but i got back almost all my money and then guess what i would do do it again go buy another thirty thousand dollar row home fix up the house a little bit do the whole process again. So I kept recycling my home equity line of credit over and over. At, at, at one point, I had 22 uh, of these row homes in between 
uh, in between Frankfurt and Tarsdale, Cotman and Ron. That was my turf. There were a couple properties that were a little bit out of it. Uh, one was on like Erdrich Street. One was in Holmesburg over by Father Judge. You had a question, Tom? Yeah. What do you think is a fair amount to raise the rent by? I mean, you as know. As much as you can get away with. Well, uh, let's be realistic. I mean, what did you say, 10%? As much as you can get away with. <laughs> I'd say to somebody, like, you know, I, I, don't, I typically don't ask tenants any questions about the rent. I, I invoice all of my tenants. And I don't call them up and go, hi, uh, hi, Susie, I'm thinking about raising the rent. Uh, how would you feel about a $75, uh, $75 increase? I don't do that. What I do is I send them an invoice that says, your rent is going up $75. Here's your new payment. This rent is good for one year, okay? And end of story. There's no conversation. That's it. If they leave, fine. I'll go into property. I'll repaint it. I'll fix a few things. And I'll rent it for even more. So I can't lose, in my opinion, on that arrangement. Okay? Uh, so what else could I do? I could explore first-time home buyer opportunities. If you're, if you're trying to buy your first house, you know, there's a lot of good uh, mortgage plans for people who uh, are first-time home buyers. I know a guy who actually uh, is in Executech, and he specializes in nothing but first-time home buyers' houses. He won't even take you if you've owned another house. I, I, I don't know why it's just his thing. That's what he does. If the bank will give you money, you take it. Take the money, okay? Unless they're charging you like 19% interest, take the money, all right? And I can make an argument that the 19% interest makes sense in certain situations, if the deal is worth it, okay? Improve the home by creating value for it, okay? Raise the rents to create even more value. That is the business. If you don't think you've got the backbone to do that, you go open a flower shop or something because you're not cut out to be a landlord. Okay, all right. So how do you stay in the real estate business? You gotta be tough. Look at that picture of this kid. That's me when I was five, <laughs> all right? Now tell me that kid ain't tough. Right? I'm probably thinking, like, Mom, what the hell are you taking my picture for? I'm busy. You know? <laughs> yeah, I am on the beach. Yeah. So how do you stay in the business of real estate? You keep looking for deals all the time. Even if you're broke, look for them. You can wholesale them. You don't need money in this business. If you think you need money in this business, you better hang around here for a little while because you got a lot to learn. Okay? I once bought a building for $2.1 million with $10,000 in the bank. And I'll be telling that story on October 9th in my building. If anybody would like to come, you're all welcome. Every property I bought, I said I was going to live in it. Why? Because prior to 2008, you could get a loan. I, I had two good buddies of mine who were mortgage guys. And they had a whole filing cabinet of all my houses by the time I was done in Mayfair when I had all these houses. And I never got turned down for a loan, and my friends would do me some favors. Some of the favors they did for me was like when I didn't have enough money to get qualified for the loan, they would doctor 401k plans that weren't mine. I didn't even know about it, okay? I really didn't even know about it. I'd be on a golf course three months later, and my friend would go, what the hell are you picking on me for? Don't you know what I did for you on that last property? I'm like, what the hell did you do for me? He goes, I used my wife's 401k plan to help you get qualified. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. I'll buy you a beer back at the clubhouse, you know? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, do I have any regrets about the real estate business? Yeah. I sold too many of my properties, right? If I have any regrets, I pretty much regret selling every home I've ever sold. If I had kept every one of them, and, and, and to be honest with you, I don't think that was possible because I had multiple periods in my life where I needed money. And I, I went almost 25 years without a job. So sometimes you got to have some money, right? You got you to feed your family. You got to pay your mortgage. You got to take care of things. So I went through different times in my life where I had rough periods and my houses were my savior. 
I could always take a house like Arthur Street. I sold it. I don't even remember what year. I sold it. I forget what I got. 20 grand, 25 grand, whatever the heck it was. You, that's one thing great about this business is that you have these assets which you can use should you need to use them. I just wish I didn't sell them all, okay? Because I, I'd have a couple of million more dollars right now than I have. But, you know, it's spilt milk, right? What the hell are you going to do? You got to take care of your family. It gets easier as you get older and you get richer. It gets easier, right? You know, you get more established. You got a lot of more options. You got all these houses that have equity in them. I could do a lot of things. I have like a million dollars of equity in Executech, and I haven't even tapped into that yet. I haven't even like tried to borrow it, and I think I'm going to start doing that soon. Okay, so we started this thing out saying, should you pay off your house? You should pay off your house, but not until your real estate portfolio replaces your income or close to it, all right? <clears throat> You want to pay off your debts when you've replaced your income from your real estate portfolio. If you could do that, that's really something special. If you could pull that off, you're a pro now. In my mind, you're a pro. Having enough quality real estate. And, and that's going to be a lot of work because <clears throat> you can't just go, ah, as a tenant in there, I haven't been in that property in five years. That doesn't get it done. You have to go put your eyeballs on it. You have, to, you have to spend some money on it. When they call you and tell you there's a problem, you have to do something about it. Fix it, right? Take care of your properties. And those properties will take care of you, okay? You'll be able to borrow money against your portfolio. Use the funds to buy more properties and improve the existing properties that you have. As the cash flow grows, and it's going to grow, because you guys are going to raise the rent. All right? Unless your mother's living in one of these buildings, you can cut her a break. Everybody else pays. Okay? And you're going to get wealthy through the cash flow and the equity that's accumulating. All right? It, it starts to snowball on you. And when I really started to realize this was around 2003 to 2008. I went from a guy having virtually no net worth to being worth a couple of million dollars during those years, 2003 to 2008. Now, of course, when 2008 came, the values came crashing down again, but I became a multimillionaire during that time. And it wasn't because of anything brilliant that I did other than keep buying, keep fixing, keep raising the rent. Okay, it just kept doing the only thing I knew how to do. Just do it. It's an easy business. You don't need to be a genius to be in this business. To me, this is the best way to get rich. Because it, it's just going to happen. If you're lucky enough to live to old age, you will be a rich person in this business. All right? Especially if you're young. Especially if you're in your 20s right now. Oh, my God, the potential for you to become very wealthy is very, very possible, okay? Dave Ramsey preaches safety. I preach freedom. I want you to get to a point where you don't need to work for anybody, that you can live off of your smart investments. I look at the properties that I own. When I drive by them, to me, they're like a monument to a good decision that I made or maybe even a brilliant decision, right? In the case of Executech, I still can't I tell that story all the time. Lots of you have heard it. I still can't believe that I pulled that off, of buying a $2.1 million building for 10 grand. I tell that story, and they go, he, he couldn't do that. I'm like, yeah, okay, man, right? Okay, quit your job, and then just play tennis all day long. That's all you gotta do, right? <laughs> This is a little family picture. <laughs> yeah, I am a uh, student of Donald Trump. First book I ever read was uh, The Art of the Deal in 1985. And just reading that book, I felt like I was standing behind his shoulder listening to him talking about these deals. And it inspired the hell out of me. 
And uh, that was even before I bought my first property, I read that book. That book, if you haven't read it, I think it's one of the greatest books ever, okay? It really preaches to work hard, to be smart. Join a place like Investor Schooling that can help you with what you're doing. Raise the damn rents. Buy more properties and more properties. Create value in those properties. Live your life to the fullest and just make shit happen, right? <laughs> That's all you got to do. Have some guts, have a backbone, and make shit happen. Real estate business, I promise you. You might, if you're new to the business and you never did it, your first property, you'll be scared. We'll help you, so don't worry about it. We'll help you through every part of it. And before you know it, you'll be an expert at it, and it'll just be another deal, another deal, another deal.